But today we're continuing our series on the church. Uh, last time we were together, we were in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. And since it's been two weeks uh, ago, since it's been two weeks since we've been in Acts, uh, let me start by giving you a quick review of what happened up to this point in the first two chapters of the book of Acts. Real quick, previously, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus gave his disciples their mission. And this is the mission of the church. Jesus' mission is for his people to be his witnesses. And that what it means to be a witness is basically it means to share the news about Jesus to everyone, everywhere. But before his disciples can take off and accomplish this mission of sharing Christ to everyone, everywhere, they would need to wait in Jerusalem for the, for the proper equipment. Which means in order for them to be equipped for their mission, they needed empowerment. And they needed the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts chapter 1. Then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit arrived and came upon them in power. But before, before, uh, b before the disciples came, uh, went off and began to spread the message, already the Holy Spirit was working because the Holy Spirit drew many, many, many devout Jewish people to the Mediterranean. And they, from, I mean, throughout the Mediterranean, they were all gathered in Jerusalem for a Jewish holiday called Pentecost. And that was the perfect setting. The Holy Spirit came upon the first 120 Christians. They began to speak in tongues. Now, these tongues in Acts chapter 2, we explained, were legitimate languages like Arabic, Latin, Parthian, and other known languages of the ancient world. And it, these languages were foreign to the first 120 of Jesus' followers, but they were very clear and they were understandable to many of these Jewish pilgrims that were gathered in Jerusalem for this Jewish holiday. So they began to understand the gospel. They began to understand uh, the praise of God in their own native tongue. And upon seeing and hearing this first group of Christians speaking in their native tongue, these Jewish pilgrims began, pilgrims began to respond. Some of them were confused. Some of them were convinced that something supernatural had occurred and concluded that, and others concluded that these early Christians were just drunk. That, that these guys were drunk. So that's where we pick, off, pick up today. Okay, so I'm going to speak fast today because we got a lot. So anything you miss, please go online and, and you can listen to it and just kind of rewind it and, and, and hear it again. So I'm giving you the warning. I'm going to talk fast, okay? Let, let's pick up where we, where we are, Acts 2, verse 14. First point. Ready? Here we go. Let's get, in, let's get at this, okay? Peter explains Pentecost from the Bible. All right, today what we're going to see is what spirit-empowered preaching looks like. Peter gets up. He's obviously filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to preach the first sermon to get the church off the ground. And he's going to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it look like? What does he do? What type of sermon launched the first church, the, first, uh, the beginning of the church in the New Testament? Okay, we see in verses 14 to 21 that he begins by explaining the Bible. Okay, so notice in verse 14, it says Peter takes his stand with the other 11 disciples. This includes Matthias, right, who replaced Judas. So Peter's the leader. He's the first among equals. He raises his voice and he declares to them, and notice verse 14, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, give heed to my words. In other words, he's saying, you guys better listen up. You Jewish people, men of Judea, you listen up to what am I about to say. And this is amazing. Why is this amazing? I'm going to tell you why it's amazing. Because this is the same Peter who was afraid of devout Jews on the night that Jesus was taken, or the early morning that Jesus was taken to be crucified. This is the same Peter who was afraid of persecution from Jews. And here he is addressing a bunch of devout Jews, and he says, 
you better listen to my words. You give heed to what I'm about to say. So we see the growth of Peter. We see that Peter now filled with the Spirit speaks in boldness about Christ. And in verse 15, Peter explains that these men aren't drunk. Look at verse 15. It says, it's only the third hour of the day. That would be 9 a.m. 9 a.m. So people don't get drunk the first thing in the morning. That's what he's saying. Peter obviously hasn't been to L.A. He obviously hasn't been to Las Vegas. Okay, people do get drunk at 9 a.m. So that's not his point. Okay, his point is that 9 a.m., the third hour for the Jewish people, this was the hour of prayer. And most of them would not eat. They would not begin to eat until after the hour of prayer, about 10 a.m. And it was customary for Jewish people to have food and wine together. And so most likely, if they had any wine, it would be after 10 a.m. So that's the point he's making, especially at a religious festival like this. Especially at a religious festival where you have devout Jews, they would not be drunk. Okay, they would not be drunk at 9 a.m. Then in verse 16, Peter begins his sermon by explaining that these events that they observed at Pentecost, people speaking out in these supernatural foreign languages that could be understood by others, right? Peter explains that actually God predicted this in the Bible. Actually, this was recorded in the Old Testament, spoken by the prophet Joel about 800 B.C. So that's about 500 years earlier. In other words, Peter is saying to the crowd, what you see taking place here is exactly what the Bible said would happen. What you see here is what God already predicted in the Old Testament that you devout Jews already believe in. So in verses 17 to 21, Peter cites Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. So that's what he's citing. Okay, he, he cites Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Now, there's a lot that can be said about Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. Uh, if you grant me three hours, I'd love to take you through it. But for the sake of brevity and clarity, I just want to point out two things. Okay, uh, that's supposed to be number one and two. Okay, so uh, the coming of the Spirit and the cosmic signs that will take place right before the Messiah returns to the earth, these are the two things that happen. Okay, these are the two things that, that Joel predicts. The coming of the Spirit and the cosmic signs that will take place right before the Messiah comes to earth. In other words, Joel speak, spoke prophetically, which means he spoke forward looking, predicting things that will take place in the future. Now, Pentecost, what we understand now as New Testament Christians is that Pentecost, Pentecost was the first stage of what we know as the last days. So whenever you hear this term, last days, it's like, ooh, dawn of the dead, or ooh, you know, ooh, last days, apocalyptic language, ooh, you know, scary things are going to happen. You know, the devil's going to show up. Uh, actually, the last days, uh, it's not referring to a week. It's not referring to a few days. The last days actually refers to an entire period of time. Uh, in the Old Testament, the last days refer to a time period of great hope where the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom here on earth. But what Joel and the other Old Testament prophets did not understand was that the Messiah would come twice. So the last days would happen when the Messiah would come. And so they just thought, okay, the Messiah is going to come. The, it's going to be the kingdom. This kingdom is going to be eternal. This is it. But what they didn't understand is that the last days would, would, would begin with Jesus ascending and going into heaven. And it would, it would go all the way until the time when Jesus returns. What they didn't understand is the Messiah would come twice. The first time that the Messiah came was 2,000 years ago, which is what we have recorded in the Gospels. That's the New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first four books of the Bible record the first coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The second time the Messiah will come is at the end of this age. He will return not as a servant, 
Messiah, not as a suffering servant, but he will return in full glory as a warrior king. And at that time, he will come in full-scale glory. But what you have in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32 is both. And that's why for some it was confusing. You see in verse 17, notice in verse 17 it says, The Spirit will be poured out on all mankind. That's not saying that every single human being will receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's not saying that God's going to pour His Spirit on every single human being. The rest of verse 17 uh, and verse 18 explains that all mankind just simply refers to all types of people. See, because in the Old Testament, the special prophets, unique priests, unique leaders, specific individuals were anointed when the Holy Spirit came on them. And then for the rest of the Israelites, for the rest of the Jewish people, the Holy Spirit would dwell in a tent in the temple. You know, his presence would not anoint all of them. But what's different is that now in the New Testament age, in the age of the church, in these last days, every single true follower of Jesus Christ is filled and possesses the Holy Spirit. We all receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means that he will, he will pour out his Spirit on all types of people, not just prophets, priests, and kings, but all of God's people would receive the Spirit. When it says sons and daughters, this speaks of every generation. Every generation of Christians will receive the Holy Spirit if they are true born-again believers. Uh, young and old means every age, old and young. Right, bond slaves, men and women, refers to every class of people and every gender. In the ancient Near Eastern times, we know that there was a, a class hierarchy. Uh, men were seen as superior to women. And, and Jesus comes and says, regardless of your social economic class, whether you are an employer or a bond slave, which was an employee, right? whether you're the manager of the household or you work in the household, whether you are a male or female, God does not discriminate when it comes to the Holy Spirit. He will pour out His Spirit on all people who have Jesus. And that's the point that he's making. When it says prophesying, visions, and dreams, these words are used to describe the supernatural work of God uh, through the person of the Holy Spirit. So I'll give you a few examples. You don't need to turn to these. These are just references. Okay? Uh, in Acts chapter 10... It, it tells us that Peter received this vision of that he could eat Gentile foods. Okay, so, so that's an example of, of the activity of the Holy Spirit. Peter received visions. Later in Acts 16, again, you don't have to turn there. You can just write it down and look it up at home. Acts 16, the Apostle Paul receives a vision to go to Macedonia. Okay, so those are two examples from Acts where, where the Spirit is working and He's giving uh, his, his leaders vision. Okay, vision. And then in, in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, generally it refers to prophesying. And prophesying was when God spoke His word through people. Okay, so we see prophesying, visions, dreams. These are examples of the activity of the work of the Holy Spirit working through people where the Holy Spirit empowers His Word or His ministry to take place and to happen through His people who are filled with the Spirit. And then in verses 19 to 21, Peter quotes the apocalyptic language used by Joel. Again, apocalypse, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge word. It just means end of the world type of language. Like, oh no, the world's going to end. Apocalyptic language. That is what we mean. Okay, that's the end time type of language. You know, the sun's going to bleed and fall out. There's going to be these huge earthquakes and water's going to flow everywhere. Volcanic activity. People can be running from zombies. That is apocalyptic type of language. Though, you know, none of that is true. Okay, but uh, what will happen is what's recorded in the Bible. And true apoc apocalyptic language happens here uh, when he quotes Joel. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the sky turned dark temporarily. As Christ bore the judgment of God for our sins, that was only a foreshadow. Because right before Jesus returns, there will be wonders in the sky, signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. 
The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great glorious day of the Lord shall come. It's hard to explain exactly what that looks like because none of us have seen it. But I take it literally. Okay, I, I take it literally. I, I believe uh, that that's going to happen, the moon turning to blood. I, if it's symbolic of something, what is it symbolic of? Okay, so the moon's going to turn to blood. I, I've never seen it. We can't show you slides or Google images of what that might look like. But what we know is that is end time type of language. That's end time type of language when Jesus will return a second time. How do we know this? Because Revelation 6, verse 12, just write that one down. Revelation 6, verse 12, uses the same exact type of apocalyptic descriptions to describe the time immediately preceding the return of Christ. And that's how we know. You know, here at our church, we are futurists. And, and we believe that this will happen still, that there will be a tribulation, there will be this time of great upheaval, and then Christ will return. Okay, so this leads us to our second point this morning. The first point was that Peter explains Pentecost from the Bible. He points to the Bible and he says, what you saw was the first stage of the last days that was prophesied by Joel. By Joel in Joel chapter 2. And what we await is what Joel also prophesied, which is the second stage. You see what, you see what, Joel, Joel, uh, see what uh, Peter did? He's doing expository preaching. That's what he's doing. He's saying the Old Testament might have saw it, as just one event happening at the end of the world, but I'm telling you, I'm going to explain this Joel passage to you that actually the first stage is what you just observed at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on people. You see what he's doing? He's saying this is what, what you saw was in the Bible. God did it. Now let me explain to you because you might not understand what just happened there. Now let me do some expository preaching. And that's what he did. Okay, he explained the Bible. But explaining the Bible is only part of preaching because just explaining the Bible does not save. It is the proclamation of Christ alongside of the proper explanation of the Bible that leads people to new life. Right? And so the second thing that Peter does, first he explains Pentecost from the Bible. The second thing is he proclaims. He explains, he proclaims, he proclaims Christ from the Bible. Okay? And he's, he's constantly rooting everything in the Bible. So in verses 22 to 36, super long passage, we'll try to punch through as much as we can, okay? Telling me that I got to flip the slide. All right. Notice starting in verse 22, Peter moves from his explanation about the outpouring of the Spirit to a proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ. And here you see a basic sermon where he's preaching Christ. And you could pretty much break it down. In verse 22, he talks about the life of Christ. In verse 23, he talks about the death of Christ. In verse 24 to 32, he proclaims the resurrection of Christ. And in verses 33 to 36, he talks about the exaltation of Christ. What is Peter doing? He's preaching Christ. Okay, so first, let's look at verse 22. Peter addresses the crowd directly. Right? He says, men of Israel... And so he has his target. So he cares about application. He cares about the context of who he's preaching to. Okay, he, he, has, he is filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit empowers him to know his audience. And so he doesn't have to explain a lot of Old Testament background. He knows that the people who are listening to this are Jews. And so he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, meaning he's from Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, meaning you heard about him, you saw him, your leaders killed him, which you yourselves know. In other words, the Jews had heard about the man Jesus. And he says uh, that he performed the miracles, wonders, he healed people, he casted out demons. These are the signs, these are the wonders that Peter is referring to. Then in verse 23, Peter does not hold back. He addresses them. He says, men of Israel, if you don't think I'm talking to you, look, I'm talking to you. Right? So this is direct expository preaching. Okay? He knows his audience, and he goes at it. 
right? In verse 23, he, he speaks of Jesus' death, but what he does is he boldly confronts them of their sin. So look at verse 23. He says, this man delivered by the predetermined plan. Oh, man, I wish I had two hours. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. Hold back, okay, because it's about Christ, not Calvin, okay, right now. But by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, Jesus' death was a sovereign death. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. What, 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 what us? I, I'm just a Jewish pilgrim. I'm just a Jew. I'm, I'm from Egypt. I, I had nothing to do with, with that. I'm here for the Jewish holiday. I'm here to have some food. I'm here to, to worship God. And, you know, I'm a devout Jew. Well, what are you talking about? I killed Jesus. I did not kill Jesus. You see, what, what his point is, Peter's point is, no, your leaders represent you. Your leaders represent your nation, and you crucified Jesus. Your leaders, Israel, handed Jesus over to the Romans and had him crucified. His blood is on your hands. So Peter is not holding back. This is not a seeker-sensitive message, though he's preaching to call people who are seeking, right? He's preaching to call people who don't know that they need Jesus, right? And he's preaching it to them. So it says, you nailed him to a cross. In other words, your sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Beloved, that's true of us. Our sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Christ Jesus came. He died. In our place, he stood. He bore the wrath of God for us. We deserve to be there on the cross. Jesus took our place. And that's the weight behind Peter's words here. And then notice also in verse 23, we see the divine mystery in the interplay of God's sovereignty in, in salvation. Sovereignty is a big word that means God is in control. Okay, God is completely in control of Jesus' death. Jesus' death was not a mistake. It wasn't like Jesus miscalculated. Oh, this Judas guy looks great. Oh, no, this Judas guy betrayed me. Hey, Father, do you see this? How come I didn't see that? Holy Spirit, why didn't you tell me? Why don't you tell me Judas is going to betray me? It wasn't like that. The Romans are going to crucify me. Oh, no, there's nothing I can do. Father, deliver me. You know, Jesus knew. God knew. Before the world was ever created, God knew that Jesus was going to the cross. It was no mistake. That's what it means. He was delivered by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God. God knew. But notice the human responsibility here. Ah, here's the balance. Notice that it's, notice the conviction. He says, even though these Jews willfully murdered Christ, this was part of God's sovereign plan. So you see this interplay that God is completely in control, yet Judas, the Jews, and the Romans are fully guilty of, of giving over their Messiah to be crucified. So, so this is a divine mystery, a divine interplay of God's control, his sovereignty, and human responsibility. And God planned to save you and me from sin and death by sending his only son to the cross. And Peter makes the point to this Jewish audience that Jesus' own people, the Jewish people, along with the help of godless men, they murdered him. That is a strong message. It's a convicting message. And in verse, verses 24 to 32, Peter doesn't just leave it there because that would be bad news. You killed Jesus. You're guilty of your sin. You guys are all damned. Good night. All right, 120, let's go back. You know, that's not the gospel. You see, the gospel is hope that Jesus died for our sins in our place, and there was a resurrection because God accepted his sacrifice for us. And so that is the glory of verses 24 to 32. Uh, look with me at verse 24. It says that God raised Christ from the dead, and it says putting an end to the agony of death, which means the pain of death was temporary for Jesus. And if you are in Christ, death is temporary. Death is the one thing that humans fear a lot. But if you have Jesus, then we know death is only, death is only a change of address, the words of Dr. Bill describing Pastor Chuck Smith. Okay, when you die, you, you go to heaven. You change your address. You're in a better place. You're with God. Okay, so we know that the agony of death is put to, put to death. And then look at verse 24, how he explains it. Verse 24, it says, For it was impossible for Christ to be held in its power. 
Meaning how powerful is death? Death is powerful. It ends your earthly life. But it's not powerful enough to defeat Jesus. The one event that so many fear is death, but yet death is powerless compared to Christ because the Holy Spirit caused Lord Jesus to be risen, to rise from the grave. And in verse 25, once again, Peter goes back to the Bible. He quotes King David from the Old Testament. Notice in, in verses 25 to 28, we see a citation of Psalm 16, 8 to 11. In verses 25 to 28, you see a citation of Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. And again, Peter proclaims Christ on the grounds of Scripture. But notice verse 25, the word for, F-O-R, for, for you. You see, Peter is grounding his preaching on the Bible. God raised Jesus from the dead, and it says, for David says of him. What is he doing right there? He's explaining it for you and me. So he, he reads the scripture, and he doesn't just leave it. He doesn't just say, oh, Psalm 16, 8 to 11. He says, Psalm 16, 8 to 11. He cites the psalm, and he says, for David says of him, and he's going to explain it. Notice Peter cites Psalm 16. He goes on to explain the meaning of it for us today. And notice in verses 29 to 32, he explains clearly David was not talking about himself. And then he preaches. He says, we all know in our relevant context, we all know that King David is dead. His grave is a landmark in Jerusalem. We all know where he's buried. And we know that, that David wasn't talking about himself. So when David wrote... You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Peter is expositing the text, saying, David was prophet prophetically not talking about himself. He was prophetically talking about Jesus. And so here, Peter is preaching the resurrection of Christ from the Old Testament. And this is Peter's point in verse 29. Then in verse 30, Peter explains that David was talking about one of his descendants, one that God promised to David who would be the Messiah, Jesus. Then in verse 31, Peter points to Psalm, the Psalm to Christ. Notice what he says. Look at verse 31. David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. So he preached Christ from the Old Testament. When it refers to Hades in this passage, David is not using Hades as a reference to hell. A lot of people think Hades is just talking about reference to hell. It's not. Don't have time to get into that today. But when David is using Hades, it is a general reference to, to a place where dead people went to in the Old Testament times before Christ came. Hades could be a place where good people go. Hades could be a place where bad people go. And most scholars believe that Hades, there was two parts to Hades. There was a part like a hell. There was a part where, where Old Testament believers went to await Jesus' coming. And so, again, we don't have time to get crazy into Hades today. But what I will say is that David would never have saw himself in hell. Okay, so David certainly was not talking about himself, though. And here we see a model of preaching for our church today. Peter used the Bible as his source of authority, and then he spent most of his sermon simply explaining the Bible. Okay. Lastly, exaltation. Notice in verses 33 to 36, Peter talks about Jesus' exaltation, which means Jesus' resurrection after he was res resurrected, he is exalted to a place of glory at the right hand of the Father. Notice verse 33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you, you both see here. So this is amazing because, because what Peter is preaching and what Luke records is that Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God and it's from Jesus that Jesus is pouring out the Holy Spirit by the authority and the delegation of the Father upon his believers. All right, so verse 34 to 35, Peter cites the Bible again. This time, what does he cite? Psalm 110.1. Okay, so again, Peter cites the Bible. And so he cites Psalm 110, verse 1. 
And he says, the Lord said to my Lord. Oh, I wish I had time to get into that. The Lord said to my Lord. Jesus, you talking to yourself? Yahweh, you said to your son. What is that? Ask me about it in Sunday school. Okay. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Trinitarian conversation. The language of making your, your enemies your footstool is figurative speech. Meaning Jesus' enemies will all one day submit to him because he is Lord. Again, Peter explains the Bible, making the point. And here's why that is crazy. Because the word Lord is Yahweh. And that's a sacred name. And anybody who claims to be Yahweh is blasphemous. And Peter is saying, you devout Jews, you listen up. The Jesus that you murdered by means of your leaders has risen from the dead. He is exalted and he is Yahweh. When Jesus said, I am, I am the Lord, right? That is, he is the I am. He is Lord. He is exalted. That is huge. The language of making your enemies your footstool, that is strong language. And so again, Peter's not holding back. And in verse 36, we see that Peter did not just leave them with a few Bible references. He gives them application. Application, right? And these were Jewish pilgrims. And he says, therefore... Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him Lord, he's Yahweh, and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Again, the application is, you guys are guilty. You, you all did it. You're guilty. He points it right at them. He doesn't just kind of just read the Bible and say, okay, well, that's God's word. Let's pray now. He says, this is God's word. You killed Jesus. You need Jesus. All right, so he points it right there. So if I could summarize this huge, long passage in one paragraph. It's Peter got up after Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit. He explained the supernatural events of Pentecost from the Bible. Then Peter proclaimed the life, death, resurrection, and exaltation of Christ. From there, the church began with 3,000 conversions, and it continued to grow. And so the point is the church grows through spirit-empowered preaching. And spirit-empowered preaching, the central truth of our message, Spirit-empowered preaching seeks to explain the Bible and to proclaim Christ. That's as simple as it is. That is the work of preaching. Read the Bible, explain it, preach Christ. Okay, part of explaining it is application. So, so let me give you that, and that's what I asked for the extra five minutes for. Okay, application. Where does this show up in your life? Most of you don't preach, so how does this apply to you? It applies to you, okay? There are... There are three simple words that I want you to walk away with. Okay, whenever you're listening to God's word, whether it's preached on the radio, whether it's preached from this pulpit, whether it's taught in Sunday school, whether it's during your devotion time, listen, learn, live. Listen, learn, live. Okay, three words. Listen, learn, live. Listen. Don't just listen to the preacher but listen to the Holy Spirit through prayer. That means that when you're listening to a sermon, you should be asking, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me? Because the common thing I know, at least for me, is I listen to the preacher. Does this guy make sense? Where is he going? Is he going to preach Christ? You know, where is he going? Is he going to explain this text? Is he going to add a cross-reference? And then I'll be like, tempted my hand in, in my pocket, but I'm not about to pull it out. I'm like, what's the charger score? What's the Charger score? And I just want to look over at some of the Charger fans over there. Are they happy? Are they sad? Because I'm pastor. I can't look. But, you know, I'm, I got grace. So they, if they're looking, I just want to know, you know, are they like this or are they like this? You know, and I'm not encouraging you to do that, but I'm going to tell you that's what I'm thinking. Because no human being can pay attention for 45 minutes straight. You cannot. Okay? So you're going to pay attention for 20 minutes. Then you need like 10 seconds just to, okay. And then you're like, oh, well, where is he again? Where is he again? Oh, he's talking to me now. Okay? So... That's, that's what I'm thinking. But how many times do we listen, Holy Spirit, this is your word. That guy's supposed to be filled with your spirit. He's supposed to be speaking in the power of the spirit. This is your spirit-inspired word. What do you want to say to me? Right? So if you're a Christian, then listen for the Holy Spirit. The word of God is perfect. Us preachers, we are imperfect. You are imperfect. We as human beings are imperfect. But the Holy Spirit is perfect. And naturally, you will listen to us, okay, uh, but listen to the Holy Spirit. Pray, Holy Spirit, help me not to take a five-minute nap. You know, just whatever it takes. You know, you, you pray, you, you get into holiness mode, yeah, I know, okay. So, you know, just, just, just pr pray, 
You know, because I easily get distracted. I even noticed, like, when, uh, when David Wong shaved, I noticed that from, I was like, oh, he shaved, you know. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm saying, okay. I, I get just as distracted as you. Uh, even in my own sermon, I get distracted. I'm constantly wondering if the Chargers are, 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 are beating down the other team. Okay, so, so that's, that's that, you, know, you know where my heart is. I'll be honest with you, right? Second, learn. Learn what the Bible is saying. More important than what myself, Pastor Jackson, or Pastor John is saying to you. Okay, our words are, are meant to help you understand the Bible. Make sure you check. Okay, is this true? Let me, let me look. If, you know, he just said something. Let, let, me, let, me, let me look. Right, because the word of God is authoritative. Okay, the preacher is meant as a conduit to present God's word to you. So make sure that you check by studying. What is God's word saying to you? Is it true? Is it false? Does it line up with God's word? So listen for the Holy Spirit. Learn what God wants to say to you from the Bible, from the original authors. And lastly, live. But under live, I have two points. Okay, under live, there's two points I want to make. One, live out the Bible in the power of the Spirit. Two, live out the Bible in the context of your relationship with Christ. So when it comes to living out the Bible, the Bible is meant to be lived out. About a week ago, I, I shared with you, or two weeks ago, I shared that the Bible is not just a book of information. The Bible contains a lot of information. But the biblical information is meant to lead to transformation in your life. Information ought to lead to transformation, and that happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you see there are three people involved in preaching, did you know that? Every time a sermon is preached, there are three people involved. Who are those three people? The Holy Spirit, supposedly the Spirit-filled preacher. Thirdly, the Spirit-indwelt believer, the listener, or the unbeliever. You see that? There's three people involved, the Holy Spirit, the preacher who's supposed to be led by the Spirit, and then the believer who's indwelt by the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that the Holy Spirit will empower the preacher to explain his Spirit-inspired word. Then guess what happens in your conscience? you got a Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says to your conscience, oh, no, what that guy's saying, that's heresy, that's not true, don't listen to it. Okay. Or, better yet, the Holy Spirit's going to say to you, you know what, he explained the Bible to you. That's the word of God. You take it or leave it. But that's the, that's the word of God. You better apply it, right? I don't do that. The Holy Spirit does that to you. You see what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit uses his word through the conduit of the preacher empowered and led by the Spirit. And he takes that Spirit-empowered word to your conscience, creating spiritual, Spirit-created change in your life. And so when you live out the Bible, it's to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit too. Live out the Bible in the context of your relationship with Christ. In other words, everything in the Bible must be applied through a relationship with Jesus. I am not saying, I am not saying that every passage talks about Jesus. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that Jesus is every rock and every stone. You know that. Okay? That, that, that I'm not saying Jesus is everywhere in the Bible hiding. He's about to come up. Okay? But what I am saying is there is not one biblical principle, there is not one biblical passage, there is not one biblical application that you can rightly apply apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. You try to apply these biblical principles, but you don't have Jesus, it's meaningless. You don't have the power of the Holy Spirit to carry it out because there's no relationship with Christ. You, you, it's not going to make any eternal impact. Okay, so every passage of the Bible, every principle needs to apply through Christ. And the reason I make that point today is that Peter preaches Christ. That's his message. He explains the Bible, but then he puts Christ in front of them. You know, in the last two years, God has convicted the life out of me on this. And that's, that's what my passion is. Now, to, to show you Christ. So my prayer, English congregation, is every week you would come in here and that, and that you would say... I, I wonder what, uh, what, what Hanley or John or Jackson's doing. I, I want you to say, what does the Bible say and how does it help me grow in Christ? I want you to look at that Bible and say, show me Christ. Not so much show me Christ in the passage if it's not there, but show me Christ. Show me Christ through the explanation of the Bible. How does this help me live for Christ? How is this calling me to change for Christ? How does this help me to depend on Christ more? How is this showing me that I need more of Christ? Show us Christ. Christ. 
That should be your call to us. That is your accountability. If I come up here and preach you a bunch of principles and don't give you Christ, it's lifeless. And see, my conviction, my conviction three, four years ago is I, I got to teach all these young people, but I want them to see Luther. I want them to see Calvin. I want them to see Spurgeon. I want them to see Edwards. But God has convicted me. Show them what Edwards saw. Show them who Calvin marveled over. Show them who Luther was broken over. Show them the external word. Preacher man, Hanley, show them Christ. Show them Christ. And so I was so convicted because I was preaching this message, but I wasn't exalting Christ. And so some of you are, might be wondering, Hanley, how come you don't talk about Calvinism as much anymore? Are you still five point? Yes, I am. But let me tell you who Calvin was moved by. Augustine, who was moved by Christ. Augustine was moved by Paul, who was moved by Christ. Christ will change your life. So my prayer is that each week you would come here, show us Christ, show us Christ, show us Christ, show us Christ. God, will you reveal your glory? Will you reveal your glory through the preaching of your word? Show us Christ. Christ. Let me pray. Father, I pray that we would see Christ. And Lord, I pray that all these other teachers that we revere and look up to, all these radio preachers, that we would just know that they're just trying to point us to Christ. Lord, I pray that we would not elevate any man over Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand your word through the Spirit, explained in its proper context, but applied through a relationship of Christ. Lord, we love Jesus. We love your Son. Lord, I pray that because we love your son, that you would move us to love his word and to want to live it. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen.